something very mysterious happened in that part of the world that historians have chosen to bury. A tribe called the Khaza, Khaza, chose to embrace Judaism. And so the world witnessed for the first time the very strange phenomenon of a non-Semitic people becoming Jews, non-Semitic becoming Jews. And these people, the Khaza, chose to convert to Judaism, but they did so not for any religious reasons. They were not so much interested in the Kitab <laughs> and to follow the law. They embraced Judaism for purposes of political expediency. They were sandwiched between Islam and Christianity. Byzantine Christianity, and they chose Judaism. Then they came under pressure to take sides in a growing contention around them. Coming down from the north was Eastern Orthodox Christianity, and coming up from the south was Islam. And they knew that if they succumbed to pressure from either of those to join their organization and embrace their philosophy, would surely offend the other. And so what they did was a politically expedient maneuver. He called in all the religious leaders of the area and he got their input and after the input he announced for me and my people, and we're talking about 20 million people and about 4,000 nobility, for me and my people we choose to become Jews. Now this was not a heartfelt conversion, this was not something that was deep in their breasts that they felt they needed to uh, make a conversion because they thought that was the proper way to serve the Creator. This was something that was done as a political expediency. Now these people have run into some trouble over time. In 965 AD they were overrun by the Vardanians which was Swedish, Swedish ruled Slavic people. Varganian is the Russian word for Vikings. And they were militarily defeated, which curbed their expansionist philosophy for some time. And then in 1140, they were literally overrun by the Mongols for uh, Kublai Khan and Genghis Khan. And they were driven down into Eastern Europe. for uh the rabbis were in Medina and the Quraysh sent a delegation to find out from them how can we tell whether this man Nabi Muhammad is indeed a prophet the rabbi said, ask him three questions, which only a prophet can answer. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sending the answers to the three questions. One of the questions was, ask him about the great traveler. Ask him about the great traveler who traveled to the two ends of the world. So with question one, ask him about the great traveler who traveled to the two ends of the earth. And we are told that this traveler is called Zulkarnain, the one who possesses two, Karn. And Karn can mean a horn, so Karnain will be two horns. And Karn could also be an age or an epoch, a time. So Karnain will be two ages. 
So this is a man who is either of two horns or impacts upon two ages. I am going to tell you something about him which must be remembered. Behold, we established him on earth securely with the power and with the means, with the capacity and the knowledge and the right means to achieve anything that he might set out to achieve. And so surely a superpower. Not an ordinary power, a superpower. Fatba Sababa. And so he chose the right means now to do what he wanted to do. He set out on a journey to the west. And uh, he reaches a place where the sun is setting. And there he found it setting in a body of water that was Hamia, dark, murky. So visibility in that water will be very shallow. And there he came across a people. Is it possible for us to identify that body of water? If we can, we'll be on the way to locating the geographical location of the area in which we're talking about. We're going to do that in a moment, inshallah. Then Zulkarnain set off on the second journey now. And he's going to the rising of the sun. And when he had traveled to the distance that he could travel, the Quran does not tell us how far it was. He came upon a people, Lamnaja'al min duniha sitra. A people, Lamnaja'al lahum min duniha sitra. We have not provided for them as a covering other than this covering. It appears to us that it is the natural covering that you have from the sunshine. So a people living a primitive way of life. And he left there as they were. And then he went on to the third journey, which is verse number 92. And so now he travels in the third direction. He comes to a place between two, a path between two mountain ranges. On this side are mountains, on this side are mountains. And in between there is a pass. Can we locate geographically where we are talking about? Is it possible? A path between two mountain ranges. And there he come across he came across a people He came across a people whose language he could not understand. Because their language was unique. Their language had no connections with other language in that region. It was a language which was not connected with all the other languages in that region. When they had learned to communicate with each other, then these people spoke to Zulkarnay and said to him, Ya Zulkarnay, O Zulkarnay, in the Juja Juja Musiduna fell up. Gog and Magog are committing acts of facade in our territory. So Gog and Magog have PhDs in facade. O Zulkarnain, can you help us? 
you have the power. Can you build a barrier to protect us from these people? He should have said, I don't need to build any barrier. I'll move in there and I'll beat them up. And they won't touch you anymore. So I don't need to build any barrier. I'll go and teach them a lesson they'll never forget. But no, he didn't say that. They said, we're prepared to pay you. He said, I don't need your money. What Allah has given to me is more valuable. So he agreed to build the barrier. What I need from you is your labor. Help me with your manpower. And I'm going to build a barrier between you. Now, number 96, verse number 96. Bring me blocks of iron. And so that has to be a geographical location where there's iron ore. It has to be a geographical location where there are mountain ranges and a pass between the mountain ranges. It has to be a geographical location where on the left you have a body of water which is so dark and murky that visibility is very shallow, okay? And it has to be an area where there are large deposits of iron ore. Bring me blocks of iron. And after he had covered the pass with blocks of iron, he said, build a furnace, blow with your bellows, and now bring me molten copper. So he poured the molten copper, and the engineers, we have an engineer here, tells me that this could prevent rust. And after he had built the barrier and covered it, the Quran speaks it changes from the word sabdain to use another word, sabathain. In verse number 95, Atuli Zubar al Hadid, Hatta is a sawa bain as sabathain. Previously, the word used was sabdain, but now the word uses sabathain. Sabdain is two barriers two mountain ranges. But Sadafain is something else. It is like the two sides of a shell. We're going to have some pictures just this now. The two sides of a shell, you've been to the seashore. When you open a shell like this, it'll be joined at the bottom, but open at the top. That's the shape of the path between the mountains. Join at the bottom, open at the top. Hmm? So when he had blocked off this space, this sadafain. Now, the molten copper is put on it. And then, Gog and Magog could neither scale the barrier, nor could they penetrate it. So they are now trapped behind the barrier. And so, Zulkarni now says, هَذَا رَحْمَةُ Rabbi. This barrier is constructed in, in, in consequence of Allah's kindness and grace. For إِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ رَبِّي But when that time come of which my word has won, is a futihat. They will not return to reclaim the town as their, as their own until is a futihat. Until Gog and Magog are released. When that time comes for Gog and Magog to be released, so that Banu Israel are to be brought back to the Holy Land. Nabikum Lafifa. Brought back as a motley crowd. At that time, Ja'alahu Dakka. Allah is going to bring down this barrier. And it become dust. Now let's turn to the pictures. And see whether we can locate. This is the Caucasus Mountains here. The white being the snow. And on the left side there is a body of water which is so dark and so murky with so much algae in it that it has been given a name. And that name has been there with it for many, many, many years. Even the time of Ibn Kathir. It's called the Black Sea. <laughs> it's called the Black Sea. Why? because it is so dark. 
if you go to the Mediterranean Sea and you're on a ship, you could see several meters underneath the water. But if you go to the Black Sea, you'd hardly be able to see more than one meter underneath the water. On this side of the Black Sea is the Caspian Sea. And in between the Caspian and the Black Sea is this body of land. So we see that Zulkarnain is traveling in that direction to the west and then in this direction to the east. The Caucasus Mountains are an unbroken range of mountains from that end to this end. But in between the Caucasus Mountains, there is one pass, only one, in between. It's called the Dariel Gorge. Let's see if we have, there we are. There is the gorge. And there's one side, and there's the other side. And it's like an open shell. See, the Quran is describing this, Sadafain. So we have, I believe, established for you the geographical location of God and Magog. The people who are located behind the barrier. Behind the barrier, on that side of the Caucasus, were the Khazar. On that side of the Caucasus were the Khaza, a tribe of people who converted and became Jews. Must have been on a Sunday morning. And some of them converted from Judaism and became Christians. Must have been on a Sunday evening. So you have Khaza, you have Khaza who are Jews, and you have Khaza who are Christians. But they did not become Jews because of religious conviction. They became Jews as a matter of political convenience. So they don't particularly care for Torah and for the laws of diet and so on. So these are people who are Jews as a nation, but not as a religion. <laughs> huh? A nation, not a religion. These are the people who today control power in the world. Who are Gog and Magog? They are human beings. They are not some strange creatures living in the interior of the earth. That's Disneyland thinking. They're human beings. The barrier built by Zulkarnain was destroyed by Allah in the lifetime of Nabi Muhammad and if you don't want to believe this that I have said fine you can accept that the barrier is still there we don't have to be divided and be, be fighting with each other over it no I say the barrier is gone it's destroyed you say the barrier is still there so why do we have to be fighting and dividing ourselves with each other over this all I'm saying is if the barrier is still standing why aren't you searching for it? I think there's a question of credentials here. If a barrier built by Zulkarnain mentioned in the Quran, a geographical reality mentioned in the Quran is still standing on the face of the earth, not buried beneath the surface of the earth. What kind of Disneyland thinking is that? If it is there standing on the face of the earth, why are you not searching for it? Why has no human being seen and recognized that barrier in 1400 years? And more since the Quran was revealed. Why? 
My answer is because it's already been destroyed. But you don't accept that answer. You say Imran Hussein is misguided. Don't listen to Imran Hussein. Fine. Not shameful. Scholars don't behave like that. If Gog and Magog have been released, then we can understand the facade in the world today. Universal facade. Inna ya'juja wa ma'juja mufsiduna fil up. If they are released in the world, they are the agents of facade. They are the ones who have brought the Jews back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own. Then it's very easy for us to recognize who they are. To Gog and Magog, Ya'juj and Ma'juj. To major signs of Akhirul Zaman. And yet, our critics are emphatic that no, the Jal has not been released. Gog and Magog have not been released. If we can't find a barrier built by Zulkarnain, which is made of iron and steel, it's probably somewhere down a few miles underneath the earth. Is that scholarship? We do not want to disrespect our critics. But we say, if you are not prepared to accept that the Dajjal is the mastermind of the modern age and that Gog and Magog are the means through which the Dajjal pursues his mission on the earth. Then we're very sorry, we're moving on. We can't wait on you. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam was asleep at the home of his wife Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha. And he woke up from his sleep when the hadith is located in Sahih Bukhari in several different versions from several different sources companions. So we say it is mutawatir. He woke up from his sleep. What he had seen in his sleep, also a vision like Ibrahim alayhi salam, was so terrible, so terrible that his face was red, flushed, red. It has to be something terrible for the Prophet of Allah to wake up with his face all red, flushed, red. What did he see? He woke up and he spoke these memorable lines. He said, Arab min sharrin qadik taraba. Woe unto the Arabs because of an evil, shab, an evil. It can't be an ordinary evil for his face to be so flushed red. It has to be a very great evil, which is now close. And then he raised his hands like this and he said, Today, <coughs> today means this day. Or one thousand years from now. Where has reason fled? He said, today a hole has been made in the radam. He didn't use the word sad, he used the word radam. Surah al Kaf has both the words. When they ask Zulkarnain to build it, they use the word sad. When he built it, he used the word radam. And the hadith says the radam of Zulkarnain, of Yajuj and Ma'juj. Today a hole has been made, indicating that the great evil, which is going to devastate the Arabs, has not as yet occurred. It is an end time event, because the words Gog and Magog are there. What is this great catastrophe that is coming on the Arabs? What is this great destruction that is coming on the Arabs, which has not as yet come? Where is Islamic scholarship today? Why are you not asking these questions? And I'm not asking the Malay ulama. I'm not asking the Indonesian ulama. I'm asking the Arab ulama. She asked, who? Zainab, radiallahu ta'ala anha. Anuhlika, will we be destroyed? Anuhlika, halaka, 
to destroy huh? will we be destroyed this is the word she asked will we the Arabs be destroyed when there are righteous people amongst us the hadith is in Sahih Bukhari he said Naam yes and then he went on to use words I never understood until recently until I saw the pathetic state of Islamic scholarship today and the even pathetic state of those who lead Muslims today he said when the scum prevails then it will come and today the scum prevails they have eyes and yet they cannot see they have ears and yet they cannot hear they have hearts and yet they do not understand they're worse than cattle they're the scum and when the scum prevails then the destruction of the Arabs not the Malay not the Turks the Arabs will take place but I want to take you now back to that spot in the Caucasus mountains because we want to fine-tune our attempt to identify Gog and Magog it is not sufficient to say that Gog and Magog are the European Christians and European Jews no because amongst the European Christians and European Jews there will be those who become Muslims there will be those who are our friends and allies do not make the mistake we have to look for a people who will eventually be moving from that northern area and moving towards Jerusalem Shortly after the death of the Prophet وسلم, something very mysterious happened in that part of the world that historians have chosen to bury. A tribe called the Khaza. Khaza chose to embrace Judaism and so the world witnessed for the first time the very strange phenomenon of a non-Semitic people becoming Jews non-Semitic becoming Jews and these people, the Khaza, chose to convert to Judaism, but they did so not for any religious reasons. They were not so much interested in the Kitab <laughs> and to follow the law. They embraced Judaism for purposes of political expediency. They were sandwiched between Islam and Christianity, Byzantine Christianity, and they chose Judaism. These European Jews who have no racial, biological connection with the Banu Israel multiply. <laughs> Nasser, they multiplied and multiplied and breed it to such an extent that today nine or nine in every ten Jews in the world, 90% or more are European Jews. They outnumber the Semitic Jews by nine to one or ten to one. 
these European Jews, if you look at the list of names of Nobel Prizes for science, for literature, would you name it? You will find that these are people who far exceed the rest of mankind in their intellectual brilliance, in their academic achievements, in their scientific research. They are a people different from the rest of mankind. We recognize the town to be Jerusalem. And we ask the question, who are those who liberated Jerusalem and brought Banu Israel back to Jerusalem? If you can recognize who they are, you have recognized God and Magad. And we find in Surat Al-Anbiya only one more reference. The Gog and Magog. In which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about a town. Remember the town? And he had destroyed the town, punished it by destroying it. And then expelled the people of the town. Waharamun ala qaryatin ahlaknaha. And then he banned the people of the town that they could never return to reclaim that town as their own. They are in a state of permanent exclusion, banned from returning to that town. Until, until when? Until God and Magog are released. And Gog and Magog, when they are released, they spread out in every direction, which is one meaning. And if you spread out in every direction, then you'll take control of the world. The land, the sea, the air. Read Toynbee. Read Arnold Toynbee. Read a book called Civilization on Trial. I'm giving you good books to read, incidentally. Not comic books. Read Arnold Toynbee, the British historian. Read a book entitled Civilization on Trial. You should get it on the internet. It was written somewhere around 80 years, 90 years ago, 1935, somewhere around 70, 80 years ago. And in that book, Arnold Toynbee points out that modern Western civilization has risen upon the world with a mission to take control of the whole world and he says the land, the sea, the air, everything. He said it in that book. They spread out in all directions and with the indestructible power they take control of the world. For the first time in history, one people will control the whole world. Nobody ever did that before. The other meaning is that they descend from every height. So they target you and they impose themselves upon you. You can't get away from them. Which town is it? Which town is it? That is linked with Gog and Magog, which is the biggest footprint of all. Which town? We used this methodology that we looked at all the ahadith of Prophet Muhammad pertaining to Gog and Magog to see whether there was any town mentioned by him that is linked to Gog and Magog. 
And when we had studied all the ahadith, we found only one town, only one in the hadith. And it is Baytul Maqdis, Jerusalem, and Quds. And so we said, well, here is a hypothesis which is already resting on fairly firm foundations. Since this is a town mentioned in the Hadith that is connected with Gog and Magan. So let's look and try on the shoe and see whether it, foot, it fits. Why can't we do that? So then we looked at Jerusalem and we found that this is a town which was destroyed by Allah and Banu Israel were expelled from the town even though Allah had given the land to them. And so we recognize the town to be Jerusalem. And we asked the question, who are those who liberated Jerusalem and brought Banu Israel back to Jerusalem? If you can recognize who they are, you have recognized God and Magog. But Iqbal it was who said, and I now have to quote him again in Urdu. And they can't take it away from him. You can't do it. It's there. Some of you will say, oh, we heard this before, you know. Oh, we never thought about it. All the forces of Gog and Magog have now been released. It's not just that they have been released from behind the barrier bit by Zulkarnain in Surah Tulkaf of the Quran. More than that. They've all been released and they've all spread out over the world. All. So this is the world order of Gog and Magog. That is what Iqbal is saying. Chashmi Muslim Dethli Tafsir Harfi and Silu. Now Muslims, you better turn your direct your eyes, direct your attention to the word. Yan Sirun. Direct your attention to the word Yan Sirun. Only one scholar in the whole world of Islam, only one, not only recognized it, but proclaimed it. What is this word Yan Sirun? He's referring to the Quran. That's what he's doing. Wahum min kulli hadabin yan sirun. And after being released, they spread out in all directions, taking control of the world in the world order of Gog and Magog. Iqbal recognized it. Iqbal understood that Gog and Magog were released. Iqbal understood that we have lost the Khilafah because of Gog and Magog. And Iqbal knew that the Khilafah cannot be restored so long as Gog and Magog control the world. He knew it. And he said it. But I want to take you now back to that spot in the Caucasus Mountains because we want to fine-tune our attempt to identify Gog and Magog. 